Dr. Martin Ion, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I've been trying for 50 episodes, exactly 50 episodes to get you on here today. So it's uh, great to finally have you here. Yeah, that's nice to hear. So tell us about yourself and your job in Mnemonic. Yeah, um, my name is Martin. I'm the head of research at Mnemonic. Um, awesome. And I've been with Mnemonic since 2013 and mostly worked in threat intelligence. And then f about three years ago, I was asked to uh, head a group of R&D people in Mnemonic to build mm. <laughs> further build on our R&D capacity. Mm. So that's what I've been doing since then. I lead a team of brilliant people. Mm. So why does Mnemonic have an R&D team? Yeah, I mean, we, we support uh, staying ahead of the curve. We do research and innovation projects, uh, but we also do hands-on operational stuff. Mm. So, so we, we know the challenges that we're facing, mm. and we're trying to help solve those. Uh, and we also participate in externally funded projects from the Research Council of Norway, from uh, the EU, and so forth. Why don't you tell us about some of the projects, the research projects that you're working with? Yeah, um, the biggest one at the moment is called Socrates. It's an EU project where we're trying to develop a next generation platform for security operations centers and uh, incident response teams. Cool. Uh, and the reason we're in that project is because a, a previous project was building a new uh, threat intelligence platform mm. that we're bringing into that project as one of the components of that. Act, platform. right? Yeah. Mm. You said threat intelligence and incident response. Um, and I think uh, I understood the whole idea was like automating threat intelligence. Sem yeah. Semi-automating. Semi-automating, cool. Yeah. So uh, how do you look at threat intelligence from uh, where you're sitting? I usually use Gartner's definition of threat intelligence, but that's pretty long. So to try to boil it down to the essence is basically knowledge about threats mm. that can help you make the right decisions. Mm. So you need to know your adversaries. You need to understand who they are, why they do what they do, whether or not you're a target for them, how they operate, how you can detect them, and how you should respond to them. Mm. So it's decision support. Mm. From the strategic level, I mean, making the decisions on what do I need to invest in? How do I need to, to improve? All the way down to purely technical things, like how do I detect them? Mm. Uh, if I detect them, how do I respond? How will they respond if I block them? Mm. If I try to restrict their access? Should I block them immediately or should I wait and see uh, do I know that this specific attacker usually deploys, uh, uh, has multiple ways into your infrastructure? We've seen one of them. Mm. Might they have more? If we, if we stop them now, could they come back through a different route and, and uh, will we be able to detect that and so forth? So threat intelligence is all that knowledge mm. uh, that makes you, that helps you make the right decisions. Mm. And as you just alluded to, there's, uh, there's a lot of information that needs to be consumed to yeah. be able to make the right decision. So uh, IOC lists and things like that. There's a lot of like structured stuff, and then there's a lot of unstructured stuff. Yeah. Um, and you're talking about automating this, right? So how do you uh, help us wrap our heads around that? How do you how do you even go about automating so much information when it's not, you know, some of it's structured and some of it's not unstructured? Yeah, unstructured information is. Uh, I mean, a lot of the available information is written for humans. Mm. It's hu human readable text, so it's easy for a human analyst to understand the content, but it's hard for a computer to. Mm. Uh, but you can maybe it makes sense to, to relate to the to the intelligence cycle because you typically start with collection. You need to collect the information. Mm. Some of it is structured, some is unstructured, uh, and we want to automate that the, the information collection. Mm. Uh, that's not really difficult. Uh, it's just uh, finding the right sources and uh, downloading that information. Mm. Uh, but then, um, for unstructured sources we need to extract structured data so mm. we use some natural language processing some pattern matching and so forth mm. um, then you have enrichment so once you get new information you want to contextualize it so just a simple example if you if you get information that there's something malicious about a domain name uh, you might do enrichment uh, by a lookup to a malware analysis system to see have i seen any malware samples communicating with this domain Mm. If so, uh, were they classified as a specific malware family? Uh, and then you can link that information to do we know about specific threat actors that use this malware family and so forth. Mm. What, what kind of malware is it? Is this ransomware? Is it a, a remote access tool? So the enrichment is contextualizing this. And uh, the, the ACT platform is basically a graph database at a low level. And 
so what the enrichment does is building out this graph. Mm. So you have a lot of unconnected information, but through enrichment you start connecting it. Mm. So you take small islands of information and connect them together through enrichment. And then you have analysis. So we have a lot of information uh, or, or knowledge about threats. Then could we uh, analyze that information to gain new insights or knowledge? Mm. So we have some uh, we, we have some workers in the ACT platform that analyze the existing information and add new information based on that. Mm. And then finally, it's in the intelligence cycle, you have dissemination, uh, like sharing the the results. But uh, in our case, that's actually two different things. One is information sharing with others, and the other one is countermeasures. Mm. And all the way, we I said semi-automate, and there's a reason for that. Uh, we we don't th we don't think it's feasible to replace the human analysts. Uh, humans are really good at handling uncertainty, missing information, uh, making decisions based on. Uh, you, you don't have the full picture, but mm. you can still make the right decision. Have, yeah. mm. Computers are really good at repetitive tasks, handling huge amounts of information. So the goal is to make the hu humans do what they're best at and the computers do what they're best at. Because humans are not really good at repetitive tasks. You get bored, uh, you do mistakes. Mm. Um, so we don't want to replace the human analyst, we want to enhance them. Mm. Uh, that means two things, it's to make them more efficient and to make them more accurate. Mm. So help them make the right decision in a timely manner. Mm. Interesting. So let me say I'm an energy client, right? Uh, how is how is this sort of the Socrates or everything you're just talking about? How is that going to help me help me in my daily my daily work? The goal is to uh, help you detect intrusions or attacks against your organization or infrastructure, and also help you make the correct decisions on how to handle them and that includes understanding the threat that's the threat intelligence part but it also uh, includes understanding your own infrastructure and um, your business processes and the potential impact that this specific intrusion could have and choosing a course of action that weighs both whether or not this is an effective way to stop the attack against mm. what kind of business impact will uh, I mean if you if you if you say that okay I'll cut off my internet connection mm. if you're an online shop that has a pretty, pretty big, big deal, yeah. business impact so you probably don't want to do that mm. I mean that, that's a very stupid example but uh, the goal is to to weigh the impact of your countermeasures versus how effective it will be against the attack itself Mm. And then all of this is uh, connected together with an orchestration engine. So each of the partners in the project develop one or more of these modules. Mm. And then you have this orchestration layer that uh, communicates with the different mod modules and presents the results to an analyst that makes the final decision. Mm. So uh, yeah, each of, each of those 10 organizations is adding a piece to the puzzle, basically. Yeah. yeah. So it's an innovation project. So we were bringing previous results into this project. and, and uh, Taking it a step further, plus integrating everything into a coherent platform. Mm. Maybe a little sidetracked, but uh, how how are companies working with threat intelligence today? Like if, because uh, you know, I have we have people come and ask for threat intelligence, right? And I've always wondered, like how how do, how do they work with it on their side? Do you have any insight into that? There's a big difference in the maturity level of different organizations, and um, you mentioned this kind of threat data feeds or lists. Yeah, right. you, you get a list of IP addresses and file hashes and domains. That's yeah. kind of the lowest majority. And there's a lot of companies selling that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's it, it could be useful, mm. uh, but it's, uh, it's more threat data than threat intelligence. It mm. doesn't really give you an understanding of the threats, but it might help you block uh, infrastructure. The, pr the problem with this kind of indicators is that they change very frequently because it's easy for the attackers to, to get a new IP address or a domain name or recompiler uh, malware mm. so it gets a different hash so mm. they you're kind of always chasing after the most uh, you're one step behind all the time mm. so why do companies buy those lists because there's so many companies selling that and it's, uh, it's they're not cheap you know all these lists because it's easy yeah uh, it's uh y you block a lot of threats so yeah it, it ha i mean it has a value it has value yeah um, and it's easy to implement because most your f your firewall probably uh, supports importing lists uh, mm. 
or proxies or uh, I mean it's well integrated into the to the security products available today mm. so, so it's uh, it's not hard to use it so that's like yeah common practice is you you buy a threat feed you integrate it with your firewall your proxy uh that's maybe like step one that's like the most that's where you start i guess yeah yeah what's what's like the next step up from there a uh, good question um you usually distinguish but this is what you call technical threat intelligence so mm. you're looking for okay let's start at the bottom mm. these domain names and ip addresses and file hashes that those are atomic indicators atomic indicators yeah, yeah. Mm. And then you have file and network artifacts, which are more like pattern matching. So like an IDS signature, it might not look for a specific IP address. It might look for a pattern in HTTP headers. Okay. Yeah. So, so it knows that this specific malware family communicates in this way. Okay. So the details change from time to time, but there's a pattern there that mm. you can detect. Mm. And, and then, threat intelligence providers actually provide those sort of indicators too. Maybe. Yeah. 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 Okay. Like okay. snort so signatures, common, yeah. Yara signatures to yeah. detect malware. Okay, cool, yeah. Uh, so if you go further up, you're moving into tactical intelligence, which is more about how the attackers op or adversaries operate rather than the specific traces that they leave behind. Mm. And mm. the attractive part of tactical threat intelligence is that you can get a level of detail which makes it possible to detect adversary behavior, while at the same time, it's pretty expensive for the adversary to change that behavior. Yeah. That's their mode of operation now. Yeah, yeah. They, they have standard operating procedures. They need to retrain their operators and so forth. So they don't really want to do that. Mm. So you cause more. You have the David Bianco's pyramid of pain at the top. You have what he calls TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures. And if you're able to detect an adversary at that level, you're making life very difficult for the adversary. At least very expensive for them. Yeah. Mm. And they might actually, unless they're specifically after you because you have some, something that no one else has that they really want, then they might pick a different target too. Mm. So tactical threat intelligence, one very good resource there is uh, MITRE's Adversarial mm. Tactics, Techniques and Common Knowledge, mm. also known as Attack, uh, which is a, an openly available knowledge base of adversary tactics and techniques. Mm. So more mature uh, i mean actually using tactical threat intelligence requires a pretty high level of maturity because you're not you, you're you're trying to detect step by step the things an adversary does rather than the specific indicators they leave behind mm. can you give us an example of how that actually looks we had a, um, a big ransomware campaign and this was before we had this targeted ransomware so they were just sending emails yeah. in the screen going for it yeah, yeah <laughs> spraying emails mm. all spraying over the and place. praying yeah and um, I think it was called CTB Locker, one of the first ones, where we saw a pattern where you would get an email, and then you would get a, a, a link to a domain which spoofed the Norwegian Postal Service. Mm. So they had some name uh, that you could pattern match that looked like uh, something like Posten. Yeah. Um, so we had a rule to detect that. And then we saw you get one request to that domain, and then they had this captcha. Uh, like the clicking thing. Yeah, like the, you get some um, twisted numbers yeah, or something. C3, yeah, C3, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Captcha. And then you have to enter this. I haven't seen that before. And that's, yeah. <laughs> that's to, to stop uh, malware researchers automatically harvesting the malware. Ah. So they wanted, wanted to make sure that you had a human uh, on the other side. Yeah. So once you entered the, the captcha, hmm. uh, you were forwarded to uh, a legitimate cloud uh, storage service at Yandex, mm -hmm. so Russian cloud storage, which which is a legitimate service mm. uh, through uh, HTTPS. Mm. So you basically have three steps there, and the problem was each of those three steps was too noisy. If you if you tried to detect each step separately, it was uh, you got so many false positives that it was mm. uh, unmanageable. But our Argus system supports uh, detecting procedures where you can have multiple Chains, steps, yeah. a, a chain of steps. Mm. So we wrote a detection rule where you have three steps. The first one was matching on this uh, spoofed uh, postal service domain. Mm -hmm. And then we saw an HTTP post request to the same domain uh, within a certain time frame, mm. followed by a redirect to this Yandex, uh, yeah. Yandex uh, domain mm. on uh, HTTPS. Mm. And that detection rule is that's simple form of detecting a procedure uh, was 
very accurate. Didn't cause many false positives, and it caught the the real cases. Mm. And that's uh, what you, that you call the tactical threat intelligence, knowing how that is. But you had to put that together. It required that you know you and uh, signature development group, I guess, in this case, that they had to sit down and they knew the, like the intimate details of how that worked. Yeah. And then they implemented it. Yeah, this was fully manual. Yeah. So, so detecting the or doing the detection logic there was a, a manual process. Mm. So, so, but a company there are. I mean, there are companies out there that are providing that sort of tactical threat intelligence to specific industries or maybe on certain groups is is that correct yeah yeah, yeah? yeah but um, I uh, mo mostly in human readable form yeah exactly so it's, it's hard to share that to Argus and to share that with Atos and to share that with F-Secure because yeah. we all have different systems yeah uh, and, and also you have some initiatives that try to like Sigma is a language for uh, describing detection logic uh, mm. in a vendor independent way okay but Sigma yeah, yeah. There, there are. Uh, we still have a way to go there on um, how do we share tactical threat intelligence in a way where you can automate detection based on that intelligence. Mm. How, so how are we doing that today? Are you Most, working with it? <laughs> uh, yeah, we're we are working on that. Um, currently, we've been working on something a little bit different, which is how to um, emulate an adversary based on the techniques that they use. Okay. So we've been modeling dependencies between techniques in nitro attack. Uh -huh. so, so given a given information about a specific incident or campaign or threat actor, you can uh, generate a set of attack stages. Because in, in every step you do, you do for a reason when, mm. you, when you perform an attack. And that means that you get something from every step that you might need in a future step. Mm. But that information is not present anywhere basically so we had to, to build it and we mm. built an open source tool which is uh, available on github what's that called aep adversary emulation planner cool. that's part of the socrates project that's part of it. is that our con contribution to it or one of them we brought this act platform in and yeah, of then course, yeah. this is a uh, further development of the act platform to structure tactical threat information or threat intelligence mm. so uh going back to our previous discussion the you know tactical threat intelligence what is that like the tip top? That's that's where you're at. If you're there, then that's sort of the best you can do with threat intelligence, or? I know you also have operational and strategic threat intelligence. Yeah. Um, operational intelligence is more about um, what's going on right now, uh, ongoing operations or campaigns. Like yeah. At this moment, out in the wild. This, yeah, this specific threat group is targeting northern Europe, maybe mm. the financial sector in Norway, northern Europe, or mm. the energy sector. So it's it's a heads up that uh, something is happening in my geographical region and in, in my industry or sector that I probably should pay closer attention to. Mm. And then strategic threat intelligence is more, that's more like closely connected to making in the investment decisions or, or like long term decisions on how to prioritize. So because mm. you, you want to defend against real and relevant threats, not mm. imaginary ones. Mm. Uh, so understanding the threat landscape, understanding what, which threat groups pose a specific threat to me and my organization, and am I ready to defend against those? Mm. And if not, where should I prioritize my or focus my efforts? Because everyone has a limited amount of resources, so you need to you need to choose what to do and what not to do. Mm. So do, doing the right things. Mm. And there's not a it's not a never-ending amount of money for for us security people, I guess. So it's um, yeah, no, it's not for anyone, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. No wonder there's so many threat intelligence companies. If you think about like, yeah, you, the the tactical parts of it, you have certain companies that are following, you know, certain APTs, and and you have the operational ones like um, those, you know, big international players. They probably, the Monik has a great insight of the Nordics, just an example. There's probably not that many that see as much as us, I guess. But we don't see that much in I, I don't know, South America, for example. So no one has the full picture mm. every every threat intelligence vendor is so biased they, i mean they have bias in their data sources they have bias mm -hmm. in their analysis so no one has the full picture mm. so you get lots of puzzle pieces from everywhere and they have to pr try to fit them together and that's where the sharing part comes in yeah w what's your opinion of where we are with the sharing uh, i think it's still a bit immature because 
um, if you spend a lot of effort on creating a structured graph of information, then it's a real shame when you want to share that information if you remove a lot of it. So if you have information loss when you do the sharing. Due to commercial interest, perhaps? Or no, or d simply due to that you're using standards that don't support representing that information. Yeah. Or you're using standards that are so flexible that uh, the recipient doesn't really know how to interpret the information that you, you're sending them. Mm. Uh, so for information sharing, we the goal is to have lossless information sharing. Mm. Of course, you choose what kind of information you share, but if I have a, d if I do an analysis and I get a, a graph connecting a lot of different data points, showing the relations between them, and I want to share that with another organization, the goal should be that they get the exact same graph. Mm. Not that you, if you try to visualize it, if you have, you have a graph with uh, nodes and edges connecting them, and then in many cases when people share. They just remove all the edges. Mm. You just have a, a lot of dots, mm. like a sh shotgun uh, <laughs> target, mm. uh, and um, I think that's that's a shame because you're you're removing useful information, and the most useful information is in, in the relations or edges, mm. seeing how everything fits together. Mm. And you can go like in this graph, you can go from you can go from a purely technical observation. You you, you observe a file that has a specific file hash and you enrich that through your own malware analysis system or virus total or any other source and it's classified as a specific family of malware and then you can traverse further in that graph to see that okay based on information in mitre attack we know that this malware family is used by these three threat actors mm. so you you connect that technical information to the tactical level Mm. Um, so it gives you a better understanding of the specific threat that you're facing. Mm. If, mm. You, if, you, if you can um, conclude that, okay, what I'm seeing right here and now is uh, one of the more well-known targeted ransomware groups, that's a reason for concern. So that might influence your decision on how to respond to that detection. Mm. Mm. And, you know, just a uh, probably dumb question, but, you know, the last piece there, so you connected tactical, like the strategic part. If you know that um, dark side is targeting you, what are you supposed to do about that? Are you supposed to buy like specific products or specific, uh, are you just supposed to, like what, how, how do companies actually deal with that information? I think that's challenging. The, the trend we've seen with uh, with ransomware groups is that they're they're employing tactics, techniques, procedures, and tools that are similar to what you observe from espionage actors. Mm -hmm. So so they look very much like an espionage. They do a, they do a targeted attack. They, they get into your infrastructure. They do internal discovery. They move laterally, escalate privileges, maybe even get domain admin privileges. Mm. And then when they have a good understanding of what are the critical systems in your infrastructure, um, then they deploy ransomware everywhere mm. Mm. at once mm. and then it's too late so so you actually have to have the capability to detect See that kind advanced of targeted attacks mm. to stop them before it's too late yeah and there's no easy answer there it's Not. uh you can't buy a product that does it for you no because then you just gotta yeah, and then defense and death right you have to have logging and have to have yeah. And most of all, you have to have people that understand. Yeah. People that have experience that uh, know what this, how these threats operate, and how you stop them. Mm. So, I mean, that's that's a core part of what we're doing mm. uh, as a service. Mm. I've always wondered that. Like, uh, again, stupid question, but uh, I'm just a sales guy. But like, you know, uh, we say as long as you have, or I've heard, you know, as long as you have backup then you know then you can just restore from backup but in that case where they've like been in your environment looking around and, and they deploy ransomware all the time even if you have backup that doesn't necessarily mean anything because they're still in there or no but i think the best argument or a counter argument in that case is that you see most of those groups now have uh, 
switched up their approach a bit where they also exfiltrate a large amount of uh, internal information from the target and then they threaten with uh, publishing that or selling it on the dark web. Mm. So, so most of those groups do that now. So mm. before they deploy the ransomware, they exfiltrate lots of your company information or organizational information mm. that you don't want really want to be published and then they either sell it or threaten to publish it uh, unless you pay the ransom. Mm. So they kind of have double leverage. They've encrypted yeah. your system, but uh, in case you have backups and are willing to do <laughs> to go down that path, then they also extort you by saying that, okay, then we'll publish these terabytes of it or gigabytes of information that we exfiltrated. Mm. And even if you say, okay, whatever, I still don't care, let them do that, then they're still in there somewhere, right? So it's... Uh, yeah, that, that's that's also the problem. And I mean, that's uh, one of the things you do when you do incident response is trying to scope the incident mm. to, to, to get the full picture of how did they get in, what did they do, where did they move laterally, do they have any other ways in. Mm. So, so you need to be sure about that before you evict the attacker. Mm. So, so you're still... Uh you're on you're on the side that believes that you know we should have detection mechanisms in place to make sure that you know when we when we're detecting this sort of behavior then we stop them before they get too far that's the yeah yeah cool. er, early detection helps a lot mm. and then making the right decisions when you respond mm. and that's it's difficult i mean you can say there's a reason why we have severe incident after severe incident after severe incident this is hard yeah expensive yeah. and hard yeah. yeah and threat intelligence builds into that you know like wow you're seeing these things happen that's that's where threat in intelligence sort of plays in because when you're seeing it happen you know that threat actor xyz do the do things these way yeah, this way. yeah. yeah it, it's it, you have two main benefits for how to re detect a response it's the detection part threat intelligence can help you uh, detect threats mm -hmm. also at the tactical level so mm -hmm. so it, it guides your detection engineering uh, and it, it tells you how, how you can uh, see this attacker at activity in your infrastructure. Mm. The other part is the response, because mm. there's not one simple answer. In some cases, if you have a malware infection on a single system, you might just want to isolate that and reinstall it, mm. and everything's fine. But uh, if you're seeing lateral movement from a file server to a domain controller or something like that, you don't want to just shut down those systems because then you know that something happened before this that we didn't see. Mm. So, so that's all about understanding uh, at what phase in the or uh, kill uh, not kill chain phase, but at what phase or step in the in the attack chain are th are they at the moment? Mm. Because once you see, if you see lateral movement with domain admin credentials, valid com domain admin credentials, then you have a big problem. Mm. And um, in that case, the attackers have basically full access right to, to or it depends on how, if you have segmentation and so forth, but uh, anyway, you have a big problem. Mm. So, so threat intelligence can help you understand what, you, what you're looking at and what the potential consequences could be. Mm. And mm. maybe even what, and at the top of the ambition staircase, you have the prediction, so based on what you're seeing now, what should you expect next? Mm. Who is there with those sort of, uh, like maturity level to get to the prediction phase? That's but that's what you're working with, is that with the emulation uh, piece of the puzzle that you're working with, yes? Uh, no, not really prediction, it's more about, uh, in when you get information about adversary groups, like from MicroAttack, mm. it's basically a list of techniques uh, these are the techniques that they're using these are the tools or <laughs> software that they're using mm. uh, but I think the, the main driver behind this was that we wanted to be able to emulate or simulate a specific attacker mm. because in cybersecurity we are defending against real attackers mm. and when you want to test your defenses it makes a lot of sense to Copy emulate them, yeah. a real attacker mm. Uh, the missing piece there was uh, you, you need a plan to do that, an adversary emulation plan, and one of the components there is the operational flow. It's uh, which techniques are executed first, followed by, uh, mm. and so forth. And that was missing. So we actually went through all the techniques and sub-techniques in MitreAttack, and then we mapped 
preconditions and postconditions to them so that uh, a tool could dynamically go through this and then create this or split it into attack stages mm. and tell you <coughs> what do they do at stage one what do they do at stage or what are the possibilities at stage one and stage two and so forth uh, which then could feed into uh, simulation, which is another component in the Socrates platform with, where they use, uh, this is from the Royal Institute of Technology and a uh, startup company called Forsiti in Sweden. Mm -hmm. They have a product that use attack defense graphs that take a model of your infrastructure and uh, your security controls and then simulates how an attacker, given that they have e either are on the internet or have breached a specific uh, computer, how they can get to uh, the critical parts of your infrastructure. Cool, but they didn't have uh, they didn't have support for simulating a specific threat actor. Mm. So that's one of the things we're trying to solve with that. Awesome! Wow. Well, what's uh, what's the future of uh, this whole Socrates project? Are you almost done? Are you done? Uh, we're two year in and a three year project. Yeah. Uh, we're starting, th there's uh, integration work going on now, and there will be integration and deployment testing at the end of the year. We had an early technical pilot this spring, mm. um, and we, uh, we're we gonna have a full-scale pilot on two different pilot sites in February next year. Cool. That goes on for four months. So the project is, uh, we have a bit more than one year left, mm. and we're in pretty good shape. Cool. Yeah, you don't look very stressed. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so um, then I'm assuming you're, that's going to be something that uh, since it's an EU funded project that everybody can use, it's going to be open source, the whole thing. Not the whole thing, but it's uh, it's component based and it has well defined interface. It's, it's possible to, to rip out a component and put mm. a different in there and that's mm. a well defined API to the platform. So in our case, for the Act <coughs> platform, that's fully open source. Mm. Uh, but uh, some of the components are commercial, but they are they can be replaced with other open source components if necessary. Mm. Well, uh, dumb question again, but what if the adversaries were just to download that and see how it all works and just, I guess there's not much they can do about that? Or? Uh, no, because um, the platform, I mean, there's an infrastructure modeling component there that creates a model of your own infrastructure. Mm. Yeah, and they'll never see that. Oh, well, they might if they breach your infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they got to do that, though. Yeah. 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 So, so, and there's a business, business logic uh, modeling component and an impact. And so, so, I don't know. I, I don't really know how that will be useful to an adversary. For them, yeah. Because they're missing like a lot of the vital information. That, that's what they work so hard to get anyway, right? The business process information and the infrastructure. That's what they that's what they're out after, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So, Dr. Ryan, what do you think is cool? What's on your mind? Uh, what's what's after that project? I'm assuming you're not. I hope I'm hoping you're not quitting after that. <laughs> no, no, we're not quitting. Uh, we're um, we're taking a closer look at uh, risk management and seeing if we can apply the things we learned from automating threat intelligence to cyber risk management. Mm. So, we're uh, there might be some future projects on that topic. Cool, and maybe future podcasts. Maybe episode okay. 100. <laughs> well, Dr. Allen, thank you for everything you do. Uh, you're, uh, you're awesome. You're an inspiration. And yeah, thank you for your time today. So are you. <laughs> thank you. Okay.